morning. Welcome to worship. We're going to get started this morning with a song called Reckless Love as we prepare our hearts for worship today. Grace and peace to you who have gathered in the room and to you who are joining us online. It's good to be together. I didn't ask the band this, but did we choose reckless love for the day after a wedding intentionally? Or was that, uh, 
I don't know how that works out. But uh, anyway, it's good to be in the room with you this morning. Uh, as we come together, I have just a couple of uh, uh, announcements. Uh, I think that everybody in the room has heard this, but I'll say it one more time. We have uh, some new resources in the pews that will help you to connect. Uh, if you'd like to be on a mailing list or connect with us, and also some giving options are there. There's some QR codes that we're moving into that space. So take a look at them. Erlina May would be uh, irritated with me if I didn't ask you to sign up for the All Church Retreat, if you haven't done so already. Uh, and I am uh, happy to say that the uh, youth mission trip is going to depart next Sunday. After church, I'm going to send an email or a text to the parents involved. Uh, but uh, we'll probably come to church, have our worship, and eat lunch, and then uh, head up to New York right after that. That's all the announcements I have in front of me. Am I missing anything that anybody's aware of? I don't see it, so I'll invite you to stand, and Vivian is going to call us into worship today. A call to worship. God has given us this beautiful earth and all that grows and runs upon it. God has given us breath to live and spirit to sing. Thanks be to God. God has gathered us into a community of care and worship. Let us worship God with love, thanksgiving, and praise.
Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. As you're seated, friends, I would invite you to uh, prepare your hearts and minds for a time of confession, a time of laying down those things that we have carried that perhaps have slowed us down or gotten in our way in our pursuit of godliness and righteousness. Let's uh, use the prayer that is before you and then uh, also have some silent time. Let us pray. Merciful God, whose care never ceases, we come to you as we are. We are tired from trying to do more than we can manage. We are anxious about problems which go unresolved. We are worried about events beyond our control. We do not easily let go. For mistakes we cannot redeem. For tasks left undone. For uncertain goals. We need your forgiveness and we ask for your understanding. For recovery of strength and enthusiasm, we pray for your spirit, for fullness of life, generous hearts, and contented souls. We pray to be followers of Christ Jesus. We continue together. In your mercy, restore us and lead us. Amen. Beloved, it is in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are assured that there is no sin so terrible that God cannot forgive. There is no hurt so terrible that God cannot heal. God accepts, God forgives, and God sets free. Receive the forgiving love of God. Thanks, Thanks be to, to God. God. prayer for illumination. We worship you, O oh God, and thank you that you receive us when we turn to you. We turn to you now, trusting with the promise of Jesus Christ to be with us whenever two or three gather in his name. Come to us and fill us with your spirit of unity and truth, that we may serve you in the world. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. First reading, Luke 13, verse 1 through 9. About the same time, Jesus was told that Pilate had given orders for some people from Galilee to be killed while they were offering sacrifices. Jesus replied, Do you think that these people were worse sinners than everyone else in Galilee just because of what happened to them? Not at all. But you can be sure that if you don't turn back to God, every one of you will also be killed. What about those 18 people who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them? Do you think they were worse than everyone else in Jerusalem? Not at all, but you can be sure that if you don't turn back to God, every one of you will also die. Jesus then told them this story. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard. One day he went out to pick some figs, but he didn't find any. 
So he said to the gardener, For three years I have come looking for figs on this tree, and I haven't found any yet. Chop it down. Why should it take up space? The gardener answered, Master, leave it for another year. I'll dig around it and put some manure on it to make it grow. Maybe it will have figs on it next year. If it doesn't, you can have it cut down. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now I wonder if there are some young people who would like to come up. We're going to do something a little different today. I'm sorry for those of you who are not up front here. You can come up front if you want to see the pictures. But I would like to share with you a story that relates to what Miss Vivian just read for us. I don't know if you know this story. Do you know the story of the good-for-nothing tree? The author is one of my favorite people. She's named Amy Jill Levine. And some of your parents and grandparents have read some stuff that she's written. This is called The Good-For-Nothing Tree. Once a gardener planted a fig tree. Everyone was excited about watching it grow. Its leaves would give shade. Its fruit would be sweet to eat. The children could hardly wait to taste the figs. Spring bloomed to summer, summer cooled into fall, fall blew into winter, and winter warmed to spring. Why is it taking so long, the children asked. Why are there no figs? Some people wondered, will that fig tree ever grow up? The gardener cautioned, takes time. Another summer came, another winter, another fall, another spring. There were still no figs. Some people shook their heads. This tree will never amount to anything. The tree dropped a tiny leaf. It is good for nothing. Two more leaves fell, and the tree shivered in the wind. Ah, the gardener moaned. The leaves are still so small. There's no sign of figs. This is not good, not good at all. It's time to start over with a new tree. The children pleaded. Not yet, please. The fig tree just needs more love. Ridiculous, the gardener declared. Trees don't need love. This one just doesn't grow. We should get rid of it. It's not worth waiting any longer. Please don't give, please give the tree more time, the children begged. Don't give up. We'll take care of it. The gardener sighed. Go ahead, but it won't matter. This fig tree is good for nothing. That's just how it is with some trees. The children tried anyway. They pulled weeds. They trimmed the branches. They added mulch. They watered the tree. Sometimes they got wet too. Loving the fig tree wasn't too hard. It just took time. Summer went by, then fall. Winter came. Spring arrived. Some people shook their heads. Look at those silly children. That good-for-nothing tree is just taking up space. Enough dilly-dallying. It's time to plant a new tree. But the children didn't want another tree. They wanted this one, and they didn't care how long it took. They loved the tree. They worked. They watched. They waited. There were still no figs. So the children tried again. They worked. They watched. They waited. Then as spring turned into summer, buds appeared. They were tiny. But if you looked hard enough, you could see them. Children kept watering and weeding and watching and waiting. Before long, the small leaves grew as wide as umbrellas. The children took a deep breath. What does our tree smell like to you? A child asked. I smell maple syrup. Coconut, one shouted. Vanilla, another shouted. Everyone agreed that the figs looked like purple raindrops. Each day, the children rested in the shade of the leaves. They picked the figs, peeled away from the, the wrinkly skin, and ate the sweet, juicy fruit. As summer came to an end, the children sat under the tree with a picnic of homemade fig balls. It took so long to grow, one child said. You were right to be patient, said the gardener. That's how it is with some trees. A second child said, it isn't just some tree, this is our tree, and it needed us. A third child added, it needed love. And a fourth smiled, and it loved us back. I'm glad we waited, a fifth child said. We never gave up. 
and they each took a sticky, delicious bite. That's the story of the good-for-nothing tree. I like that for lots of reasons. It helps me to remember that, that we are all different. We grow differently. Some of us learn to read when we're three years old, and some of us it takes longer. Some of us can run better or be, but everybody's unique and different. And this story of the tree helps me to remember that God loves me and watches and cares for me. And I brought something today. Levi's mom said, do you want that plant up in front of church? And I did. Let's come and take a look at it. You can come up and look. This is a fig tree, just like in the story. My daughter gave it to me for my birthday this year, and when I got it, it looked just like that one in the story. There was nothing. But do you see what I see on this tree? Do you know what this is? That's a fig. These figs are growing. I'm going to have a fig feast maybe in two months. I don't know. Oh, look. It also has a spotted lantern fly on it. How about that? Or is that one of those cool spiders? No, that's just a, no, that's a spotted lantern fly. There it is. Okay. So I was going to ask, I couldn't, in the book they could smell. Can you smell anything on this? I don't, I think it might be too soon, but can you, can you guys smell anything? Yeah, smells like dirt to me. But anyway, this is what it looks like, and if they ever get ripe, I'll bring some figs to church, okay? I'm glad that you were here. Can we have a prayer together? Let's just pray right around this tree. We thank you, God, that you've given us a chance to be together for time and for space, and that you love us all in different ways. Help us to always grow towards you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, friends. And right over on the bench here, I do have some of those activity sheets. If you like to do the word search or the coloring page, I know you have your activity booklets. But here you go. I'm going to give the last of the pile to Brogan because he always takes care of that for me. Thank you, friends. Second reading, Acts chapter 5, verses 33 to 39. When the leaders heard this, they became angry and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel stood up in the meeting. He was a teacher of the law, and all the people respected him. He ordered the apostles to leave the meeting for a little while. Then he said, People of Israel, be careful what you are planning to do to these men. Remember when Thea disappeared? He said he was a great man and about 400 men joined him, but he was killed, and his followers were scattered. They were able to do nothing. Later, a man named Judas came from Galilee at the time of registration. He also led a group of followers and was killed, and all his followers were scattered. And so now I tell you, stay away from these men and leave them alone. If their plan comes from human authority, they will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop them. You might even be fighting against God himself. The leaders agreed with what Gamal said. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For much of the summer, we are uh, considering some of Jesus' parables from the Gospel of Luke. And these teachings, which are mostly aimed at his disciples, uh, offer wisdom and insight as to how to live in relationship with God and neighbor. And in our conversation about content, we haven't spoken too awfully much about context. Most of the sayings that we've considered are shared in that part of Palestine that was then called Samaria. Jesus had been up north in Galilee preaching and teaching, but then decided that he would go down to Jerusalem. But unlike many of his contemporaries, Jesus opted to take the direct route which led him through Samaritan territory. You may know this already, but there was certainly no love lost between Israelites 
and Samaritans. And in fact, back in chapter 9, James and John are ready to destroy a Samaritan village because of some perceived rudeness that they had experienced. So Jesus and the team are on their way through Samaria, and someone grabs a copy of a Galilean newspaper. Look at this, they sniff. Horrible news. These folks have been real lowlifes. They must have been terrible people to suffer like this. And Jesus doesn't bat an eye, but he says simply, you know, you're right. And you're heading in the same direction. Unless you repent, you will be just as dead. And then he pulls out a copy of the Jerusalem Times, and he says, you think this is bad? These guys are bad. Look at this. And Robert Capon says his point, well, I hardly think that he was saying that if they could manage to repent of their sins, that they wouldn't die. The way the gospel works out, even being sinless can't guarantee that. In fact, it guarantees just the opposite, a still more horrible death on the cross. Maybe what he was telling them to repent of was actually their rejection of death, a rejection they compensated for by whistling in the dark and telling horror stories. And then he leads them right into another parable, this time featuring a couple of fellows talking about farming techniques. And a lot of times, I caution against seeing parables only as allegories where there's only one meaning for each component of the story. But I've got to say, this one seems pretty clear to me. The first character we encounter seems to be the God figure in this parable. He's a man who is so frustrated by the lack of fruit on his fig tree that he orders it to be destroyed. And that command, chop it down, it might seem a little harsh, but in reality it's not unlike that voice that we heard back in the parable of the man with the barn who was told that his own death was imminent. It's noteworthy, though, to see that the man in this story is described as the owner of a vineyard. That is to say, grapes are this man's business. Figs, well, they're, they're a side note. They're, they're his hobby. I don't want to read too much into this fact, but it is comforting for me to think that you and I are in God's plan intended for whimsy and delight. Creation has built into it this awareness that God is predisposed towards acting favorably toward us. Grace is not an afterthought. Grace is not a plan B. Rather, God's intentions toward you have always been those of love and joy and delight. But evidently, at this point in the story, the property owner has had enough. He's tired and he's frustrated. He feels like he's been at this for too long. Cut it down, he says. What's the use? Isn't that the truth? When we come across something or someone that offends us, that we are quick to declare that person or that thing to be useless. Chop her down. Get rid of him. Some of us delete people on our social media feeds. Others of us block numbers. Many of us decry cancel culture. And all of us know what, it's look, what it feels like to look at someone and say, you know what, you are just taking up way too much oxygen right now. You need to get out of here. Get out of my life. Get lost. We experience inconvenience or conflict and our reaction is to try to solve that problem by amputation. We cut that person out of our lives. We extinguish that relationship. They are dead to us. And yet, curiously, here the gardener shows up and he offers a different point of view to the master. Instead of hastening towards removal or destruction, he simply counsels, leave it. Let it alone. Eugene Peterson has written, internationally and historically, killing is the predominant method of choice to make the world a better place. It is the quickest, easiest, and most efficient way by far to clear the ground for someone or something with more promise. The manure story interrupts our noisy, aggressive, problem-solving mission. And in a quiet voice, the parable says, hold on, not so fast. Wait a minute. Give me some more time. 
let me put some more manure on this tree. Manure. Of course, manure is animal waste, horse poop, cow dung. It's smelly. It has got undigested seeds, maybe even pathogens in it. It is not manure, a subject for polite conversations. that Most of you don't want it around. And yet, if worked into the soil properly, manure can create an amazing change. It increases the water holding capacity of the soil. It improves the texture of the ground. It adds beneficial microbes, and it makes the land far more fertile. Doesn't, doesn't do those things right away, of course. Amending the soil with manure is a process that can take a long time. And so the gardener says, give me a year. I believe I can dramatically increase both the health of the soil and the harvest of this tree if we just let it be. So Jesus, who I am taking to be the gardener character in this story, promises to make things better. How does he do this plan to grow fruitfulness? Well, listen again to what he says. Leave it, he says. In Greek... That is, office of team, also translated as let it alone. And yet that word itself, office, means forgive. So you see, the, the work of Jesus is forgiveness. Jesus' plan to make the world a better, more fruitful place is to spread a load of forgiveness all over the place. And if you think I'm stretching it too far, then let's remember that if we were to flip ahead 12 or 15 pages in the same gospel, we'd hear Luke telling us about Jesus hanging on the cross, looking into the eyes of his murderers, and whispering a prayer, a prayer that goes, Afes Aptis, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Forgiveness is what Jesus does, and he spreads it around whenever he gets the chance. In his forgiving, he works to help us to create something fruitful out of even the most difficult places of our lives. Not too long ago, I gained a new understanding of this while reading a letter from an incarcerated individual with whom I correspond. They said in reflecting on all of the ugliness that went into their arrest and the pain of their incarceration, they said, actually, I find myself happy that I have had this time out to be able to rediscover myself and time to restore my faith as well. I'm telling you that Jesus works forgiveness and sometimes that forgiveness looks a lot like manure that's been spread all over our lives and worked into them. Jesus works slowly and deliberately and sometimes painfully to amend what is lacking and to create conditions in which people like you and me can produce fruit. So what do we do with this story, this call to forgive and be forgiven, to let things work slowly on us and in us and through us? Perhaps we could take a lesson from another first century religious leader to whom Vivian introduced us, a rabbi named Gamaliel. He served on the Jewish council in Jerusalem. He was a widely respected teacher in his day. He became a mentor to a young Pharisee who was named Saul. We know him by his Greek name of Paul. And the book of Acts describes that in the time following the arrest, crucifixion, death, resurrection of Jesus, that Jesus' followers caused quite a stir in Jerusalem. They were preaching new ideas. They were inviting people to relate to one another in different ways. They were encouraging new practices in faith and in life. And almost all of this was perceived as threatening to those who felt as though they had a corner on the one true faith in God. There were a lot of good, solid, religious people, folks that we would have liked to have come to this church, frankly, who looked at people like Peter, James, and John, and they wanted to do to them what they had done to Jesus, to eliminate them, imprison them, kill them, amputate them, cancel them. And yet at this trial, old Gamaliel looked at his peers and said, who knows? This may be of God after all. I suggest 
that we let them be. In Greek, afeteatus. That's the same word that the gardener used in this parable, the same word that Jesus uttered from the cross. Afes, forgive, let it go. People of God, there is a lot to be angry about right now. The people I know and love are saying things about God and God's love and God's intentions that are, to my mind anyway, they are improbable. And, and lots of times I want to argue with them. I don't know if you've ever been like this. On, you see somebody on Facebook or social media and you think, I've got to fix that. This person is wrong and I've got to step in there and say, we want to do that. And make no mistake. There's a, a time and a place for speaking out, for standing up. But, but maybe a lesson from the fig tree is that I don't need to worry about chopping anybody else down right now. Maybe my primary call in life is not to go around pruning other people. Maybe I can look at my life and wonder, is there fruit here? Am I living as someone in whom God takes delight? Maybe when I look at the lives of others, I can be similarly charitable. Yeah, I should ask, is there fruit here? Is there evidence of God's presence and blessing? But before I take it upon myself to pass judgment on these folks, maybe I need to look at all the manure that's been piled up around my roots and ask the gardener to work with me, to bear with me, and to remind me that we were all intended for God's delight. Beloved of God, I implore you to take note of the care of the gardener in your life, and I beg you to trust him in the lives of those whom you do not understand or from whom you'd like to be separated or removed. Turning again to Eugene Peterson, for those of us who are up to our necks in manure, which is to say up to our necks in forgiveness, it is perhaps important to note that the forgiveness Jesus prayed for us was not preceded by any confession or acknowledgement of wrongdoing by the crucifixion party. Pre preemptive forgiveness. Jesus prays that we be forgiven before we have any idea that we even need it. For they know not what they do. No preconditions. Amazing grace. Thanks be to God for the gift of forgiveness and the grace of the gardener. Amen.
Friends, as we uh, continue uh, in our prayers, there are a few things of which I'd like to make you aware. Last week, uh, one of our friends, Judy Jerry, was worshiping with us and she filled out a prayer card and asked me to share with you her request for her prayers for her daughter, Jackie. Jackie is a special needs adult who has been in and out of the hospital a lot in the last couple of years. And, uh, Judith is uh, finding it increasingly difficult to care for Jackie. So prayers for Jackie and for Judith. Prayers uh, also for the Mel family. Uh, Becky's not here today. Barb is having a very tough time these days, and so you might want to reach out to Barb. And also Josh told me that his Aunt Debbie had a stroke recently. Uh, and so prayers for the Mel's. Um, Barb, you wanted to bring up Yes, prayers for the uh, McNamara family. Um, Mike was taken to the hospital this morning, but the good news is, is that it seems to be dehydration. He was given fluids and is on his way back home. Oh, that's fantastic, thanks. I got a text earlier today uh, from uh, Claire and Don Weaver who are not here today because uh, they are attending the graduation of their granddaughter, Sydney, uh, from I believe it's Physician's Assistant School. So she is uh, being uh, sent into the world of medicine and they're very excited about that. Julia asked me to mention uh, the fact that next week will be a special Sunday here. Uh, we don't know exactly what form it will take, but it will be Cross Trainers Sunday. And so we will celebrate the ministry of that uh, camp that has had 50 or 60 kids coming every day for the last five weeks. They're in the home stretch. One more week left to go. Uh, and uh, also, if you would like to take part in one of the most fun days that this building has to offer on an annual basis, the Cross Trainers Talent Show uh, is going to be Friday morning. Time is still to be determined as we negotiate contracts and talk with agents and so on, but um, the, uh, uh, it will be in this room, uh, we think, sometime Friday morning, and look for the church's Facebook feed uh, and, uh, or call uh, Julia or Brian, and they'll let you know exactly what time. Is there anything else that I'm forgetting? Hold on a second. Let the people at home hear. My coworker Donna is struggling with gallstones, okay. and also a friend, uh, Nathan, has Lyme's disease. So if you could keep both of them. E is it Ethan? Nathan. Nathan. Yeah. Prayers for Donna and Nathan. Uh, one of my coworkers, Nuria, had a great joy yesterday of a new baby boy named Liam, and so she and we are grateful for that. Right. Glenn. Uh, my granddaughter's uh, grandmother's birthday is tomorrow. Your granddaughter's grandmother's birthday. No, not to say anything about anybody in this room. <laughs> no. Um, prayers for our friend Paul Seeley and his wife Alex. Um, Paul's family was the family out in Eastern PA whose um, the mother and child, children were lost in the flash flood. Mm. Um, so just keep them. Um, Paul's a one of eight kids. So yes. just prayers for their family at this time. Lots of struggle and um, sadness. Thank you. Thank you. Continued prayers for my friend Amy. Um, the pump that they put in to help with the cancer isn't working as they want mm. to. Um, so just prayers that um, whatever next steps they take um, work well. Um, also prayers for um, my friends, Nikki and Chris Brogley, their father, Ray Brogley, um, uh, passed away last week. Um, and then prayers for our family um, as we've been house hunting, um, just for patience. And I think we're going to take a little break um, because it's been very stressful. And mm. yeah, so. Okay. I mentioned we have one other joy. Uh, there should be a picture here. But uh, yesterday, David and Katie celebrated their marriage here in this room, and it was, uh, it was a wonderful, and I gotta say, it's nice to have a wedding in church. I mean, I'll go with you to the country club or wherever you wanna go, but I like doing it. I like home games, and uh, it, was, it was good. 
Let's continue and, and keep on praying. How grateful we are, oh God, that you have spoken your word into our lives and that that, that word begins with love. It includes delight and joy. It encompasses forgiveness and brings to us challenge. We thank you that your presence has enabled us to be together this day and to equip ourselves for trying to live faithfully, not only on Sundays, but in the rest of the week as well. We have named a great number of blessings and, and difficult places in our lives and the lives of people that we care about. And we do not presume to think that we're somehow whispering something to your ear that you had not noticed. But we ask that as we come into this place, that you would help us to be attentive to the way that you are already at work in these places. And we do pray that you would send your healing, your hope, your consolation, your comfort where it is needed. That you would send your message of reconciling love and hope and grace into the lives of these folks whom we have named and into those places that we don't even know we ought to be praying about yet. We thank you uh, for gifts of life and love, for celebrations like graduations and birthdays. And we ask that we might mark each of these occasions with a renewed emphasis on, on our discipleship, our following of Jesus Christ, and our living in such a way that mirrors his love in and care for the world. We pray this not on our own behalf, but for the church across Pittsburgh, across the United States, and indeed around the world. We ask that the name of Christ, that the body of Christ that is the church, might become increasingly synonymous with the love of Christ moving through the world and the justice that you intend. Help us to act as you would have us act and to be the people you want us to be here and around the world. We pray in Jesus' name, who brings us together and teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from you. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved, this is our opportunity to make a difference. You are invited to bring what you have and to share it. Don't worry that the gift that you have might be too small. Great changes can arise from the smallest gift, even as Jesus said, a cup of cold water. The gifts that we fear are too small to make a difference do matter, whether to one person or to the whole world. Let us now present our offerings.
prayer of dedication, gracious and loving God, we offer our gifts for your work in our community of faith and throughout the world. May these gifts surprise those who receive them with your love, compassion, and joy. Amen. Amen. Beloved of God, go out into the world in peace and have courage. Hold on to that which is good and return to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted and support the weak. Help those who struggle and honor everybody. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. And let all the people say, Amen. <laughs>